Okay, so we've got the shoot done now, and I've got my memory card in a card reader plugged into my computer. And so typically, um, the way that I approach transferring my images is through Photo Mechanic. A lot of people, I put them on an external hard drive first, and I always make at least one copy. So I have two different hard drives. I have a working drive and then a backup. And I recommend at least, you know, at least one backup, if not more than that. A lot of people do like a cloud-based backup and then um, a backup offsite and a backup onsite. Um, but I, you know, I typically, I typically do one. I probably should do more, honestly. But um, at the very minimum, that's what you need to do. So the way I copy my, my photos over is in Photo Mechanic because it's faster than Lightroom. A lot of people go straight to Lightroom. They drag their photos onto their hard drive and they import them into Lightroom. The reason I don't do that is because it takes a while to render the thumbnails. So picking the pictures is a little bit slower. Photo Mechanic is generally used by action shot photographers, professional sports photographers. Uh, because of its speed and it is relatively easy to use now as far as editing um, you're not going to be able to do as much it's got, it, you can open the raw files into photoshop and tone them in camera raw and crop them and save them back into um, photo mechanic but as far as toning color correcting that kind of thing some you know minor cloning things like that coloring that's all better in lightroom so i do use both programs but because lightroom does drag a little bit when you take a, your first look at the thumbnails. It takes a while to render and load those. Then photo mechanics, the easier and faster way to pick them. So uh, I'm just gonna briefly show you the way I would go about that. So I've got them on my desktop here. If you look on the left, uh, but typically, like I said, I would have them on one of my externals, but this would be this was gonna be faster. So I drag, drag, drag them over to the desktop. So I, I name everything by the year and then the day and then or the year, then the month and then the day and then the name of the shoot. So usually I'll make I'll make a folder with that as the name, and then inside that folder I'll make another folder with the exact same name, and then a non pics which is going to be all the photos that I don't select. I drag my entire take from the card into that folder, and that is that's going to be. I actually replace that. What did I do here? I renamed it. And so I'm just gonna have to quit photo mechanic and restart it. Sorry about that. Okay, let's open it back up. Okay, now I'm gonna click on desktop. I've got it in my favorites here up here on the top left. Sync sports. Okay, there we go. Now, okay, there's all my photos. And I've already I've actually already called these down just for time's sake. So that's why the numbers are jumping around. I've got down here on the bottom, it says I've got 60 that I that I picked to to bring into Lightroom and color correct or look at a little bit further. So the rest of them from the card I, I got rid of, but normally I would have the entire take on here. So what I do is up here on the top left, you see this little slider that can make the thumbnails bigger and smaller. I usually collapse this window on the left and then I make these as big as I can with the, where they don't take, that's about, that's almost full size. So they've got a little bit of space in between them here, in between the thumbnails. So I'll go through and the T button on the keyboard, which I use a lot of keyboard shortcuts. I, I recommend that when you're doing any kind of editing or retouching because it makes your workflow a lot faster. And even if you save, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds on an image by using keyboard shortcuts over the course of time, it's gonna really add up. So. I mean, there's a keyboard shortcut for just about everything. And especially in Photoshop, I really utilize them. In Lightroom, I try to also. There's not quite as many um, that work as well for me in Lightroom. But, and then in Photo Mechanic too, instead of having to mouse down and click on this little uh, box in the bottom right to, to, to check a photo, to tag it, then, you know, you, if you just press the T button, then it either, so it, that tags it, or if you press it again, it untags it. So I just go through and scan them and tag the ones that I like. Scrolling down, and some might be a little bit underexposed or whatever, but you know, we, you know, I just I'm picking the overall the ones that I think that might work that I might like. You can narrow them down further in the Lightroom, and when you get them in Lightroom, if you want to. So, and then you know, if you want to if you want to check to see if you're in focus, just double click, bring it up, and then you can press the plus button. It'll zoom in. And then minus zooms out. And then if you want to get rid of the zoom, then you just press Z and it'll go full full frame again. 
and then Command W will close that window if you want to just make sure you're in focus. So then it says um, on the right, it's going to say the zoom. That's so that's my window bigger here. That's at a fourth. If you want to go one to one, that way you can see. Make sure you're in focus there. And you can zoom back out, or you can just get rid of the zoom altogether. You can also check that box on the right there. Okay, so I'm going to press Command W to close that. So I, like I said, I've already these are already the ones that I've that I've picked. Uh, to bring in the Lightroom. I'm just going to take a few of them. And then when I get done and I have the, the amount, like I, you know, for a senior, typically I might tag between 80 and 100 for, you know, sports team. I'm going to do their name board that on, dry, on a dry erase board and then their, then their, their one portrait and the team portrait. And if there's more than one that I can't decide on, I might tag both of them. But tag all the ones you want. Then go up here and then this little drop down right here, I select tagged. And so then it shows me all the tag photos and then go back on the left and then mouse over this uh, these two little bars on the, on the on the far left until you see that little bar come up beside the arrow and then drag that over you're going to see um, your file structure again so command a will select all the images and then you click and hold and then i drag them into that folder right there so then i'll control click on this hit rename hit command c to copy and then enter so i'm just going to copy that name and then I go into Lightroom. And I don't know why I have Lightroom or Photoshop 2018 open. We're going to close that. Okay, so now I'm in now I'm in Lightroom, and so I've got in my collections over here. I've got everything organized into categories like social, sports, schools, personal headshots, families and children. This is under education, um, and then I've got a collection set. So you go over here to this plus. And you hit that and you would do create collection set. And then since you hit, since you copied what the file name is in Photo Mechanic, the reason I copied that is because I can just press Command V and paste that, which it's already in use, obviously. But so you have the same name and you would hit create and then you drag it into which this is this is a set inside of a set education. And so then inside of it, then I would go to file, import photos and video. And then select a source and go to other source and then go to my desktop and oops sorry that's my other folders go to the the file which that would be on external and then go to this folder where i dragged all my selects in hit choose and they all pop up and then you hit import and then it'll import them all in lightroom and once they all come into lightroom then i would hit command once they're all imported i would hit command a to select everything and then over here in my set I would control click on the set and then hit create collection and I would name that take for the entire take and then check the box that says include selected photos which the name is already in use because I've already created it ahead of time and you hit create and so it's going to create that collection inside that set you can't put photos into a set but you can put put them inside a collection which goes inside the set so so now we're automatically in that collection ready to go. A lot of people get confused in Lightroom because of the folders and collections, but I typically use collections instead of folders because you can organize them in any order you want to. The, the folders is an actual file structure, so you can't really, you can move stuff around, but it's going to move it on your hard drive. So keep that in mind. That's why I don't use that. And I use, uh, I use the collections instead. Okay. So you can press command. Uh, shift a to get rid of to deselect everything okay so now you can see i've already got some stuff uh, i've got some stuff colored red and i've also got some flag those are the ones that i'm going to go over retouching in photoshop with you and all the ones that i'm going to do i've got a virtual copy that's already that's already toned and color corrected uh and and uh color graded for you and then i've got the raw so you can see me go through that process but i already did it once and then i've got so i've got a virtual copy of everything so all the flagged ones are the ones that I'm that I'm gonna possibly bring into Photoshop. So then, so now that I'm in Lightroom, so if you press, if you're in the top right in the library module, if you press T, then um, you get your little thumbnail slider on the right here, and you can make the thumbnails bigger or smaller. You can also press plus or minus on the keyboard. Now I'm on a Mac too, also, so I just want to warn everybody. I don't, I know that the keys aren't exactly the same in on a PC, so I know that I think Command is something different. I'm not exactly sure what, and I apologize. But so anytime I say command, I think it might be control possibly, or or option or alt or something on on a on a PC. But um, a lot of the stuff's going to be the same. So um, so plus and minus makes the thumbnails bigger, smaller. 
If you press tab, it's going to get rid of your windows on the sides. So I don't like to use that slider. I used to, I just used to, I like to use the, uh, the plus and minus because again, keyboard shortcuts save time. So I press, I'm going to press T to get rid of that. You can get rid of the film strip on the bottom if you want to, but so let's make them a little bit bigger. So, you know, you can go through and if you've already got them narrowed down as much as you want, then you can start color correcting, but, and you can make presets, things like that. Or, you know, if you want to narrow them down even more, you can, which in this case, that's what we did. If I press tab, you know, see, I've got a selects, a selects collection here. So I went through and I, all the ones in red are the ones that I like the best that I possibly considered retouching. So if you press shift tab, then all of your windows, including your film strip pop back up. So, and that, that allows you to filter also down here, what you flagged or colored. So the quick way to color things is like, for, let's say, for example, I wanted to, so red is my color for that's going to be retouched, right? So if it, if it was something that I was going to export for a client to see a proof without retouching, then I would just leave it without a color or anything. So if I wanted to color that red, like six, if you press the number six on the keyboard, it makes it red. Seven is yellow, eight is green, nine is blue. And if you press six again, it's going to make, it's going to take the color off completely. So that's the way I go about doing it. You can, you know, choose whatever you want. You can give it stars, you can give it flags, whatever. So I've got the ones in red already that I'm going to potentially, this one needs to be red, and make a virtual copy of that. So I'm control clicking on that to make a virtual copy, which is going to make an identical copy that you can edit separately. And then I'm going to go up here. I'm going to press D for the develop module. I'm going to reset this on the bottom right to the raw photo, go back to library. Back in my grid, so now I, I forgot to to uh, color that one red because the potential that I might retouch. So don't pay attention to the virtual copies because, like I said, those are already color corrected. Um, it's basically the photo duplicated, and I've got the raw beside it. So all right, so now I've got I've, I've selected the ones that I possibly might retouch. So down here, if you go, if you see these um, these little thumbnails in the bottom right that are colors so you've got you know red through i think gray if you press if you click on the red it's going to filter the only thing you see is the photos that are highlighted in red so now we've got all the ones that we that we colored red and the flagged ones are the ones that, that i've narrowed it down even more so you, again you can create your own system for flagging coloring all that kind of stuff and you know everybody has you know different system that works and everything you know you can choose these flags to mean whatever you want to but so but it's important that you pick something and stick to it so you don't forget um so okay so the action shots probably um that's what everybody gets the most excited about typically so let's go to that one first so i'm gonna double click on it so this was actually i believe it was the first the first the first frame we took one of the first anyway so i i, I realized obviously that the, uh, the light is in the frame and that's not ideal. Um, I did move it back and I think I screwed it forward quite a bit also. But but aside from that, this is pr a pretty dynamic image. I mean, I think we're, the good thing about it is I shoot with a Nikon D850. So I know I have a 50, 50 megapixel file, raw file that, that I can crop down quite a bit and not lose resolution. I mean, you can make this thing half size and it's still gonna be really good because I think they come out at around 20 by 30 at 240 DPI out of the camera so that's pretty big you know and i, I mean you can only you, know, you don't want to crop it down too much obviously but i know i have a little bit of wiggle room and when i'm shooting wide like this so i this was the 24 millimeter lens that was my 14 to 24 2 8 so that's that doesn't have a i mean it's pretty it's a great lens but it does pull on it has some distortion on the side so i i typically when i take team pictures with that wide lens like that or or an action shot or whatever uh, i always you know keep that in mind the, the sides are going to pull quite a bit so I usually leave a little bit of room, especially to crop for an eight by 10 print. You know, if I know that something might be printed, which is most of my stuff is, has a chance to be printed. So, you know, that's okay that this is zoomed out a little bit. I, I did, I did move the light in. So if we go, if we go over a few photos, see there's the color corrected one. If we go over, so that one, if I press the crop tool, which is R is the shortcut for that. If you, if you want, if you go to the develop module up here and then the, uh, the basic tab right here on the top right, the let's see where we at actually above that there's the crop tools in the top left so a lot of these tools it's it, I, don't, I can't even find them because I, I use keyboard shortcuts so much but so like r if you press so you can go up here and click on crop tool or if you press r and i've got my little lock clicked so that i retain the um proportions 
the original proportions. So, cause if not, then you can, you know, you know, crop it however you want, but I want to keep this how it was, how it was shot. So you can see when I, when I scoot it up, now this is at 22 millimeters. The one before was at 24. And the main difference is that I moved up several feet and the light's not in this picture. So you can see it's still getting a rim light on her, but honestly, I like the first picture better, even though I do have to crop in quite a bit. I mean, there's obviously a limit to that, but this is, this is, does not exceed that. That's, that's fine to crop in for that one. But if you compare the two and if you, if you press command on a Mac and you select both, both uh, images, either in the film strip, or if you're in the grid, press G to go to the grid, you select two, then if you two pictures. And if you press N or it can be more than two, and then I'm going to hit tab for my windows to go out of the way. You can compare the two. So this is full frame. And this is obviously full frame. Also, it needs to be cropped. So that so that has more information. But and I like that one. But you also have to look. See, this is her foot because it's closer to me because I'm laying down. It's basically her body's in a very similar position. I mean, her arms aren't up as high. This arm is both arms are in a little bit of a different position. Her face isn't a ton different. I do like the shadow on her nose on this one a little bit better. It's a little more flattering. Her mouth's open a little bit, which that to me says that she's actually you know doing something full speed which this one it isn't i wouldn't say it's boring necessarily but i do i like the expression better on this one and i like the way that that flattens her out more and it doesn't distort her quite as much i guess it compresses her more because i'm further back so there's not as much distortion there's there's time which i think the distortion in this one doesn't look bad at all but i just personal preference like this one better i like the way her shirt is it's not as wrinkled on the left um, but then, you know, then again, on this one, like her leg muscles look a little bit bigger because they're closer to the camera and it look, you know, like her hamstring looks, you know, that looks flexed. I mean, it's a really athletic position. They both are, but that's, that's the difference in, in being really close to the wide angle lens and being a little bit further back. You, you get different levels of distortion. Also her right leg is, it's not as bent on this one as it is on this one. So I think this one overall is a more dynamic photo. So I'm going to go with it and just see if how much I can crop in and make sure it's going to work. So I'm going to go, I'm going to press G to go back to my grid and then select this picture and hit D or go up to develop. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is crop it. So I'm going to hit R and then rotate. So I'm going to try to get, so here's the horizon line back there. And actually what I'm going to do first, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to raise my exposure so I can see the horizon. And actually it's pretty straight. So it, it gives the illusion of not being straight because of the spill from the light. So we could have flagged that off. And, and minimize the spill or aim the light up a little bit, but I want to make sure I get got her foot, and and that's not that big of a deal. I mean, you could you can fix that, uh, and I don't think it's not as bad in this one because I'm I'm a little bit closer. But I really didn't want the ground in it as much as possible or as little as possible, honestly, because I wanted her to look higher. That is one good thing about this one. She does look a little bit higher because you can't see the grass as much, except and you can see the trees in the background. But this one, uh, another another frame that that's a little bit her foot's a little bit closer to the ground. So that one looks the highest, but I mean, but this one, as you can see where I'd already cropped it, that's what I'm gonna do now. Um, I can probably get that ground out of there. So I'm hit R and I'm gonna raise my exposure back up a little bit. So if you hold command and then hit the ruler key or the ruler, the ruler icon comes up and then you can run that along your horizon line and straighten it. And so then now if you hold option, then, and, and you drag from the corner, it's gonna bring it to the middle so i'm going to try to get that light out of there all right so this is going to work um if it was if it was a little bit closer it probably wouldn't have so and then i'm going to drag this side i want that ground out of there but I, I like this i like this grass in the air so i'm going to try to keep that so that looks about right and we're gonna have to get that cell phone tower out that's about the only bad thing that was in the background of this of this shot i don't like those poles either on the, there's tennis courts over there but i can get those out you know, you gotta just, you gotta, there, there wasn't a perfect scenario in this case. So I had to just, you know, take the lesser of all the evils that I saw. And that, and that's, and that's this one, and even though that towers in it, I know that that's not going to be, it, that's going to be relatively easy to take out in Photoshop, hopefully. So I'm, that looks about right. Hit enter. Okay. Now we're good to crop. So I'm going to hit the exposure and double click. So it goes back to zero. Okay. So the first thing I want to do, I'm going to close my history over here. Um, first thing I'm going to do is I always, it looks a little bit bright on the bottom. So anytime you shoot high speed sync, which means, you know, I, and I, I think I explained this when I was shooting that. So every, every camera has a normal sync speed, which is the highest shutter speed you can, you can sync a flash with. And 
the Nikons typically, which I shoot with, are two, one 250th of a second, which is not fast enough to freeze action outside because the ambient's typically too bright. You can do it inside uh, with flash duration, depending on the strobe. But so the drawback to using high, high speed sync allows you to raise the shutter speed as fast as you want. The, the drawback to it is that you get um, you get like a gradient over the photo. It's, uh, it's called clipping. So the bottom of the, the frame when it's horizontal will be a little bit brighter. So you can see, because I've got the key light is up towards her face, but you can see her legs and it, it's it's pretty subtle, which we were at one sixteen hundredth of a second, F63 ISO 400 at 24 millimeters. And so again, you know, I shot these both with the FJ400. We've got a long throw reflector on the right for the rim light, 45 degrees behind her, and a silver beauty dish camera left, another FJ400 with the diffusion taken off. So that beauty dish is pointed um, right at her, it's, it's pointed at her upper body. But because the faster the shutter speed, the more clipping you're gonna get. So if you go like 4,000th of a second, the bottom of the frame's gonna be even brighter. There's nothing you can do about that. It's just the way the technology works, unfortunately. Um, but you know, and, and you know, sometimes it ends up being worse than others, depending on your lighting and everything. But in this case, it's, it's, that looks like maybe a half a stop brighter down here. So it's not that big a deal, but the easiest thing to do is I'm gonna select my gradient tool over here on the right. And then I'm gonna, it usually goes about over about a third or half of the image. So I'm gonna pull that down. I, I held shift so that it stayed horizontal. And then I'm gonna raise my exposure. That's about half a stop. So I don't know if I said half a stop or not, but that's, yeah, it's about half a stop. So 0.5 on the exposure. And then, so you can see it, it brightened the sky too. The main thing I'm concerned with is her face. So what you can do is over here on the right under range mask, I'm gonna go to color. I'm gonna select this eyedropper tool and then I'm gonna drag it over her face, all the colors I want. So now what happened is it's only masking with that gradient, it's only masking her face because I'm not really worried about her shirt. It's black, it's gonna be dark everywhere. So now if you wanna look and see where that's affecting, if you press the O button on the keyboard, everything is gonna light up orange that's affected. So some of the sky still is. Now, over here under, on the right, under the range mask, you can set, select the amount. So if you, in this case, if you mouse to the right, it's gonna select more. If you mouse to the left, it's gonna select less. So that color is only, it's, it's basically selecting the reds and the oranges and yellows. And see, it's a little bit in the sky still, but now well, the more left I go, the more of the sky, it, the less of the sky it selects. But, but you can also see, it's also starting to select less of her skin around the shadow area. So if I'm like way in here, you can see that that's going to look kind of weird once you get done, because it's going to, it's going to, it's going to, the mask is going to be over her skin. It's going to all of a sudden going to stop. So I'm going to have to select a little bit of the sky, which is not that big a deal because it's basically only selecting the highlights. So, right. So most of the sky you can see is not, it's not selected still. So I'm going to hit close. Now, if you go back in your history, Actually, I don't even need to do that. I'm gonna close that. If you go over here to your gradient tool again, and you click this little button on the bottom left of that window, that shows you before, and that shows you that shows you on and off. On, and there's look at your control point if you wanted to edit it. And O also turns off the mask. So, so you can see what we're doing there. So that's before, and that's after. That's definitely makes her skin more even, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, I'm gonna hit close. Okay, so now um, we're going to go to the, the whites slider. So if you hold option and click that little carrot. Now everything that's lit up is going to be um, that's going to be more towards 100% white. And so if you if you mouse the whites over to the right, it's going to make the whites brighter and more of the whites brighter the more you go right. So I want that's probably about right where I'm at. It's going to make the highlights brighter, basically. And then black, same thing. You want to set your black point. So I'm going to hold option, click, and then drag to the left. Now, when it starts to get color in it, that's what's turning black. And then totally black is 100% is pure black. There's no there's no detail there. So I'll, And that, that also adjusts your contrast. So I want to go just far enough. And I'm going to unclick option to see where I'm at. So there's without. And so it adds a little bit of contrast. I might even go a little bit more right there. Okay, and then I always open up the shadows a little bit, get a little more detail on those, close down the highlights just a little bit. Now, one other thing, the grass is a little bit too bright down here maybe, so let's add one more gradient tool. Go back to my gradients, hold shift again. Now, this time I'm gonna mouse it from the bottom, and then I'm gonna 
So if you if you set if you make your setting on any of these adjustment tools before you actually put the adjustment on the photo, then it's going to default to that. So I'm going to I'm going to delete that. Now I've clicked on the gradient tool. It's got, see it's at 0.5 to start. If you want to start at zero, just start at zero, and then then make your gradient or or brush or whatever, and then now adjust it right there. Okay, so we're going to go down maybe half a stop. Right there. Okay, so now hit enter, and then again, there's before, there's after. Okay, so those both that's basically our whites, our blacks, and those gradient tools for the adjustments to handle the clipping. Because that bottom, even though that that is lit down there, but that clipping is also making it worse because it's more, it's hot. The frame is going to be more hot and bright at the bottom of it. Okay, so hit close. Okay, um, usually I add. I usually don't go past like 10 or 15 on my on my clarity, but I do add some punch to my sports pictures. So Command Z undo, so there's before and there's after. And I just add a little bit of punch to it, and then vibrance. I usually go to 10 or 15, and then so now I want to get into some color grading, and I try to do a lot of this in Lightroom, and then it's a, it's probably a little bit easier in Photoshop. But anything you can do in Lightroom non-destructive, I suggest doing it. So and curves don't work quite as well for me as they do in in, in Photoshop, but in Lightroom, but it's not that bad. I, I usually try to do what I can. So let's go to the tone curve first. And a lot of the my all a lot of my photos I've been told have like a blue steel look kind of, and that's I guess I've, I've had I've heard that several times. Uh, but that's because I usually put blue in my shadows and I put yellow in my highlights a lot because those are complementary colors or opposite each other on the color wheel, and you can do that with other colors too. But that's just too, I just like that look honestly. So if you go to the if you go to the tone curve and then under channel. If you open up your tone curve window and then go to blue, the way I achieved that is I click on the on the curve at the bottom because the shadows are on the left where the where the curve is down at the bottom and the top right that's where the that's where the highlights are. So if you dra click and drag up a little bit, that's going to put it's going to put blue in the shadows. And then if you go to the top of the curve and click and make a point and then drag down, it's going to put a little bit of yellow. In the highlights so you see now we've already got some color toning going on there so again let's hit that little button there before and after okay and then let's we can play with it we can drag the blue down further and see where we like it okay so now now let's go to let's go down here to let's close the tone curve for a minute and let's go to the HSL color slider. So we've got blues in our shadows, yellows in our highlights. If we go to the hue slider, and I'm gonna go to blues, instead of that looking purple, I kind of want it to be more like teal or aqua, like more more green in it. So if I slide my slider to the left, it's gonna change that blue a little bit. See, there's there's before and there's after. Let's adjust the curve a little bit. Let's bring that back up just a hair. And see if that makes a difference a little bit okay so i've got my blues more with more green in them now and then yellows or oranges the same thing skin's going to be red orange yellow mainly reds and oranges but if you want it to be like i don't like that look kind of like the limpa looking so let's go to the right and make it a little bit more yellow okay so let's turn it off and there's after that's a very subtle difference but it does make a difference it, it gives your it gives the it gives the image a little bit of a different feel to it right and then let's go to luminance. Now let's make the blues a little bit darker and the aquas and maybe brighten the oranges up just a tad just so her skin pops a little bit. And then saturation, let's go to the saturation tab. That's, we could take the color out of the blues totally. We could add more, I would tend to say more. So let's go back to our tone curve because I do like where this is going. Now we can adjust the contrast up here, but I do it more the traditional way. I've always done it in Photoshop and that's with the tone curve. So if you go up and click on the channel again and go to RGB, we're just gonna make a traditional S curve. So I'm gonna drag the shadows down a little bit, kind of like what we did with the blue channel and then drag the highlights up just a little bit. And that might be a little, whoop, I didn't mean to add that extra point. You don't, you want to leave detail, so be careful. Now, that made, that added more contrast, right? So if we go to history, 
and go back to where we adjusted the point curve. So there's before that added quite a bit of contrast, which made the blacks darker and the highlights, the whites brighter. So if you go to saturation, which that adds saturation to. So if you go back to the HSL slider, maybe desaturate the oranges just a little bit. Okay. And then just kind of play with the blues here and see what that looks like. Yeah, I definitely like the more aqua look. Sometimes my Lightroom looks a little pixely before I zoom in one time. If I'm gonna zoom in and let it load, it was looking, it didn't look like it was rendering quite the way I want it to. Wait just a second here for it to catch up. Well, I don't know why that's taking so long. There we go. Okay, now that's nice and clear now. It's nice and clean. Okay, all right. So that gives us a little better representation of what it looks like. Uh, let's go. Yeah, I like those. I like the luminous down a little bit. Okay. So if you hit your backslash button, you can look at before. Now it's not going to do crop, but it's going to show you the coloring and the contrast. So there's before and there's after. Okay. Let's just see what dehaze does. That can add or, or take away contrast. Which your photo looks a little hazy. So that's going to take it away. Let's see what if we go backwards in the contrast, what that looks like. I actually like the dehaze a little bit better. Let's go like minus five, maybe. I'm gonna make our whites a little bit, I'm gonna go back to zero and see what that looks like. I like that better. And I, so I double clicked on whites and it, it reset it. Come back on our highlights. Okay, that looks pretty good. All right, so I think this is probably ready to take into Photoshop. Now let's zoom in. Now there's a little bit, I've got, this is an ISO 400, the 850, the D850 that I'm using, it, it handles noise pretty good. Definitely better than D800. Uh, I didn't have a D810, but I, I don't know. Like I have a D4S also, and it, it the noise on that, is, it handles it better. But the files are so big and, and with this camera and the detail is so great. The dynamic range is awesome. I usually don't. And actually, we've um, we've got our sharpening up to 40 for some reason. Let's take that down to zero. So that's going to take away some of that noise. And I don't think... Uh, we didn't go to lens corrections. I forgot about that. Uh, one of the first things you want to do hit lens corrections, hit remove chromatic um, aberration and enable profile corrections. So there's before and there's, let's see. So it takes out a little bit of distortion from the lens and then and it's some vignetting. So we definitely need to click that every time. Okay, I think that looks pretty good. The, the rest of it, the only thing else I would do is maybe, I have some light, some lens flare here because of the, uh, because the light was in the shot and it was aimed at, it was kind of aimed at the camera and it flagged off. So we can take care of that in Photoshop. We can take care of it in Lightroom. And like I said, generally I like to do stuff in Lightroom if I can. So let's go up to the, the healing, the spot removal tool up here, which if you mouse over a, 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 a tool in Lightroom, it'll tell you what the quick key is. So that's Q. So you can press Q to go up to that. And then I also, for retouching, I, I highly recommend Wacom tablets. I have the Pro, the Intuos Pro small, which I think the mediums and the large, I don't even know if they make a large, but the medium is too big for me. I like the small and it's easy to travel with, but it's pressure sensitive. You can set presets on it. It's got a little wheel on it. You can make brushes bigger and smaller with, which is I'm using right now. It's a lot easier than using like the, 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 the controls or the buttons on the keyboard for making your brush bigger and smaller and softer and harder. So you can customize it really well. You can only do so much with a mouse. And after you get, after you start retouching with a, with a tablet for a while, you won't, maybe about a week. Once you get used to it, you won't want to use a mouse anymore. So I've got my spot healing brush set to heal and then my opacity is hundred percent. So I'm going to make it, I've got the edges a little, it's got a little bit of feather to it, but not much set at 30. So I'm going to get that little thing, whatever that is first a little fleck in the sky there. I don't know what that is. And then, so we've got some flare here. Let's try to get rid of that in Lightroom and I might make it a little bit more soft, my brush. So one of the, this this tool is pretty great because did used to you could just click and, and do a circle, but now you can actually draw with it. So this flare goes across pretty well, pretty far here. But I'm going to click and go across like that and just see what it does. And it's automatically going to select a spot, and you may or may not like it. And if you hold spacebar and the hand comes up and you click, it zooms out. 
So I don't know that I like that spot. Let's just go across and see. No, that's not going to, I don't like that either. That's, that looks better. But my, I think my edges may not be soft enough. So let's feather it more. See if we can find a spot that works for us here. Because it, it's I want the I want the clouds to line up a little bit at least so it looks like it's natural. There we go. So if I hit delete and I've got it selected there's before. And there's where that added in. So that does, definitely looks better. There's a little bit of purple left, I feel like, but uh, that's not that big a deal. We can fix that in Photoshop maybe. So let's get this little spot. I don't want to get the ball. Let's get that one spot. So if you've got clone selected up there, it's going to just, it, whatever you select, it's going to clone the exact same thing, which you don't want to do. Well, you do want to do sometimes. I don't want to say that. Right now, I don't want to do that. And for some reason, I'm having trouble with these clouds getting it to look natural. And then another thing, so the edge of that doesn't look great, but I might select another one or, or do another spot there right on the edge. There we go. That doesn't look bad. Nobody will ever know. Okay, so we've still got some purple going on back there with that flare, but maybe we can go to the HSO slider and maybe we can take that out. Let's see. So if you... If you click this little round button and you click in an area, let's go to saturation. Click on saturation because I want to desaturate those purples. Actually, there's some on her pants. So let's click that and then go all the way down. So you mouse down, it's going to take away. So it took the magenta out 100%. So if you hit Command Z, there's before and there's after. So that, that spot on her pants is going away, but I bet the purples, I bet that's affecting that too. And then let's make the luminance go down a little bit too. And maybe, and while we're at it, make the purple a little bit darker purple. So I'm trying to play with these sliders to see if I can make that go away. That that looks pretty good. I don't think that's really going to show up that much, honestly. And that may be some from our color toning too, honestly. Okay, so, all right, it's starting to look pretty good. Let's get these in her pants real quick. So I've got the uh, the healing spot removal tool again. Click, click, and let's let. So they, this should be easy because that's a pretty solid texture there. There's lots of area to sample from. That looks a little weird right there. Let's let's get that little spot. Okay. All right. I don't think. There's anything else we need to use that tool for? Okay. Except if you hit T and then when you've got that tool selected, if you go to visualize spots, so the more to the right you mouse, the, the more spots you're gonna see, the, the more dramatic they're gonna be. It's not showing any. So this is, I'm looking for sensor spots, which will be like little, like, like right there. There's one, I think anyway. And we shot, well, we shoot at f6.3. So the more shallow you shoot, the, the less sensor spots show up. Like if you shoot at f22, you're going to see every single sensor spot you've got in the, in the sky like this. Okay. So if I unclick visualize spots in the bottom left. Okay. All right. That looks pretty good now. So let's bring in Photoshop. So the quick key for that, you can either control click on the image and then go to edit in. Uh, Adobe Photoshop 2020, or the shortcut for that is Command E. So now it's going to launch Photoshop for me. Okay, so the first thing, the retouching skin, if you really want to do it the professional way, frequency separation is the way to go. And basically what that does I know that's become pretty popular. Basically what that does is it separates the image into highlights, I'm, not sorry, I'm sorry, not highlights, details and color. And there's a process to it to, to and the, the best way to do it is create an action. If you don't know what an action is, if you go to window, actions, it'll turn your actions tab on. Anything you do in Photoshop, it's gonna be the same step-by-step step step process over and over. 
you want to record it and save it as an action because it's going to save you time. Then you just go to the action and you click it and you hit play and it's going to run that action for you rather than having to go step by step every time you want to do that same thing. So frequency separation is a complicated, it's complicated how they, how you get to the end result on how to retouch with it. So I don't, not even going to attempt to explain that because I fully don't even understand it. But I will tell you the, the way that I did it was I just downloaded it from one of the most reliable, best learning websites I've found. That's Flearn, P-H-L-E-A-R-N.com. Aaron Nace, it's his company and he's, he is amazing at Photoshop. He is one of the very best I've ever seen, if not the best. So he's got a website you can subscribe to. I highly recommend it. I look at tutorials all the time on here. There's tons of stuff. I mean, he knows, it seems like he knows everything about Photoshop. So if you go, if you, if you go to flearn.com and you, in the search tool, if you, which is where that X is right there, if you click, if you uh, type in frequency separation, it's this first free one right here. Click on that. Cause he does have, he has free videos too. And then if you have to create an account, but you can download it, it's going to go to your downloads folder. And then you just double click on the action and it loads it into Photoshop automatically. And then, so it's this, it, he's going to give you two, the eight bit and a 16 bit. So this, this image was opened up. It was a raw file. So it's going to be 16 bits. If it was a JPEG, it would probably be eight. So you want to run it, you know, you want to run the correct, the appropriate one. I've got one that I modified for the sake of time. I'm not going to go into that, but you can, if you want to change the action, you can click this little arrow here and there's the whole process that it runs through. And so if you click a spot and you want to add like an extra step after that one spot, then you can hit record, do something, hit stop. And it's going to add it in that action, which I have done on mine, but I'm just going to run his because it, that's the one you're going to download. Um, it's going to be less confusing for those of you that aren't familiar with it. We're going to run that in a second for skin, but first we're going to take some stuff out that we don't need. So, which is pretty basic and straightforward. I pressed F to go to full screen once right here. And I have a dark gray background. If you want to change that, you can uh, option click, let's see, control click, and then change your background color. Dark gray is my favorite. I've got my rulers up, which I'm going to take off because when you paint with Photoshop 2020 with the rulers on, for some reason, it the, the tablet acts kind of weird. So I've got those turned off. It does, it's not responsive like every third time you click, which is weird, but if you turn them off, it works fine. So I'm going to hit Z for my zoom tool. First thing I'm going to do is take out these light poles in the bag. You can scrub if you want, or you can click. So I'm going to duplicate my background, which is the first thing I always do whenever I'm retouching because I don't want to be destructive. I want to be able to, you know, if I don't like something, I want to be able to redo it instead of ruining the photo. So, and I'm, so I, there's different kinds of healing. The first one is a spot healing brush and that one you don't sample. It's over here on the left. If you press J, it goes to the spot healing brush. And if you hold shift, it cycles through all the ones that would be in that panel. So the spot healing brush, healing brush, patch tool, content where move. Uh, we're going to use this one first and it was the little circle on it. And basically that's just going to, the computer, if you, so when you want to get rid of this pole, you're just going to click and paint over it. And now it's gone. Now, sometimes with this tool, you do lose texture. So you have to watch that. And sometimes you want to use the other one that you sample with. It's the regular healing brush. But see, if you take that off and turn it back on, then you can see what it did. Now, it made, a, it made her knee kind of weird there. So I'm going to go to the stamp tool. S is the shortcut. Click that. So if you hold control and option and you mouse left, it's going to make your brush bigger or smaller. If you go up and down, it's going to make it harder or softer. Okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to hold option and sample and then go up and then paint so I can just get that little knot out of there that it made right there. Okay. So the stamp tool is going to clone like exactly what you, what you sample. The helium brush uses an algorithm to, for the computer to guess what you're trying to fill that area with. Okay. So I always try this first because if it works, it's the fastest. It doesn't always work. Now I might lose some texture. I don't want to lose so you can tell I've got some noise in the background. I don't want to lose that either because it's not going to look right if I've got a big flat area with no noise and the rest of the photo has it, right? So I'm just painting over. See, that did pretty good. Now, I might have to go in and fix it a little bit where the transitions aren't very good. But for the most part, that did pretty good. So I'm just taking out the light poles. Now the healing brush doesn't like edges a lot of times, so you have to watch that. See, I'm losing a little bit of texture there. That's so small, it's not gonna matter, but you do have to watch that. So, so that this might be an area that I might have to use the clone tool with. 
but it's doing pretty good. And I, every time that is, I feel like every time they update Photoshop, this, this tool gets a little bit better, a little bit smarter. See, so yeah, I'd lost some texture there, but I just usually paint over it a few times and see if I can see if the computer will fix its own mistake. But this is doing remarkably well. So now, see, that's a little weird transition. So I'm going to go back to my stamp tool. Now I've got on my stamp tool, I've got my flow set at 20%. So those of you that don't know the difference between flow and opacity, flow builds up. Opacity is, is what it is. So if you paint with in one spot with 80% opacity, it's going to stay 80%. If you paint with 80% flow, it's going to build up and eventually be 100%. That's the difference. So I, anything in Photoshop you can build up is better, in my opinion. So that's why I use flow a lot of the time instead of changing my opacity. But there is there is a place for opacity also. And you also have to keep in mind in Photoshop, there is about 10 ways to do everything. So it's really a personal preference. Like I, I have a, a friend that's a photographer that he uses the just the brush tool to cut people out, to paint around them on the mask. And I couldn't do that to save my life. I use the pen tool, but most people hate the pen tool. So, um, so there's, see I lost texture if you zoom in right there. So stamp tool again. Just make sure all the transitions are nice and smooth. And that looks pretty good. Command minus zooms out. All right, our light poles are gone. Now, this might be a little harder. So we've got some power lines here. Let's try the spot healing brush again. Click and then hold shift. Okay, so I have my tablet and it's pressure sensitive. That's why I did that. Now. I'm gonna get my mouse for this because it's not pressure sensitive. So this, the brush will stay the same size the whole time. There we go. Yeah, that took it right out. I'm just holding shift, clicking, and then clicking again another spot. And it's making a straight line with my spot healing brush to get these power lines out for the cell phone tower or whatever they are. Now see, it's not doing a perfect job. There's, it's leaving a little bit of residue in places and that's gonna happen sometimes. It does, because the computer doesn't know at the end of the day what you're wanting to do. You've gotta keep that in mind. So now I'm gonna go to the regular healing brushes, which is right below that. So with this, I'm gonna make my edge as hard as possible. I'm gonna sample by pressing option and then paint. So now, so you can control this one a little bit more what you want. The other one, just the computer guesses. This one and this one, you actually sample a place like the clone tool, the stamp tool. This is pretty basic stuff that I did, you know, and again, I, I try to get everything right in camera as close as possible. Now, sometimes I'll shoot for composite on purpose, you know, that kind of thing, or I know something can't be fixed in camera, so I'm going to have to do it in Photoshop. But if I can help it, I don't do that because a lot of people, they're surprised at how little I retouch. And, and I try to... I try to do as little as possible and still make it look believable. I don't want to go to, I don't want to do too much. So this is pretty basic stuff we're doing here. So now let's get the spot healing brush again and paint over this. You could also do select this with the lasso tool and do, con, um, do content aware fill and see how it does. But that did a pretty good job. So now, now see the transitions in the clouds aren't perfect. So Rather than mess with that, I'm probably just gonna, I'm gonna duplicate. I'm gonna press Command J, I've got my layer one here. I'm gonna press Command J on the layer, that duplicates it, right? Now if you press Command T, you're gonna transform it, which is, means you're gonna change the size of it. You're gonna scale it. Now, if you press Option and click, no, I'm sorry, not Option, um, Control Click, Flip Horizontal, because I know that sky is gonna probably match up there, okay? Hit Enter, now it's backwards, obviously. Now if you turn that layer off by pressing the eyeball, I want that part right there, all right? So I'm gonna bring it down. I'm gonna press five. What that's gonna do is make my layer 50% opa opaque. Over here on your layers, you can see. So I press 60, it would be 60%. So now I can kind of put it in the right spot. Right there looks good. And I want that tree down low so it doesn't get in the, in the frame. What I'm gonna do is try to take that flare out. Okay, now I'm gonna press zero, press B for my move tool and then press zero now. So I'm gonna, now I'm gonna put a mask on this. Down here, I'm gonna select my mask tool. Select my gradient with G, that's a quick key for it on the left. You want your default colors, if you're not on them, you can press D and it will make your default colors. If you press X, it flips them. What you're gonna do is, 
So on a mask, white reveals, black conceals. So I'm going to start with 100% opacity, which would be white, because that reveals everything, and drag to black, which means it's going to be 0% opaque, which means it's going to, so you can see up here your gradient white to black, that's 100% opacity to zero. So it's going to create a gradient, right? So if you turn that letter off, I'm going to just make a quick press R, command R, bring my rulers up. I'm going to draw where I want my sky to be great to gradient from and then down here to the trees turn my letter back on so what I'm going to do is G for gradient tool again so I'm going to start here and drag up so it goes over that and then same thing I'm going to end oop, oops command Z go back right there and then start here and then drag across so now oop, I got to see I got the ball there a little bit get that out of there there we go now command colon gets rid of your guides Command R gets rid of your, uh, your rulers. The only thing is now it's a little bit dark right there. So if you turn it off, turn it back on, you can see the difference. It's a little bit too dark. So what I want to, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a curves layer. Go over here to adjustments, that little white, that little white and black circle, click that, hit curves, hold option. So what happens is when that bot, when you mess between two layers and hold option, it's going to, it's going to clip it to that layer below. So it only affects that layer, right? So let's clip it. I'm on my RGB curve. I'm gonna make it brighter, right? So I just wanna click in the middle, which so that blacks are on the left, whites are on the right, or highlights, shadows, and then neutral colors in the middle. So let's make it a little bit brighter. And actually, I'm gonna make another point. Let's see. The main thing I wanna affect is my shadows. And that might be a little bit too bright. So, hmm. let's, I tell you what, let's, let's hide this mask. If you click on the mask and press command I, it makes it black, right? So I'm going to paint with a regular brush, regular soft brush. I'm going to press B for my brush. I'm going to paint on this mask. I'm going to paint white, which I'm going to reveal it only in the spots that I want to see it. So I've got my mode set to normal, opacity to hundred percent, flow at 10. And then I'm going to start painting right here where I want that to show up. So see how I made that brighter? So my curves, I made my shadows brighter in that one spot. Because I don't want the highlights brighter. It was washing it out too much. Okay, now the only thing is there's some like green colors going on in there. And I don't really, I don't really like that. So I'm going to go to my, I'm going to make a hue saturation layer. And on top, and if you click this little hand with the arrows on it and then select a color, it's going to, that, that, so it's my blues, right? So I'm going to clip this to the curves layer because I only want it to, well, actually, no, I'm not. Because if you click, if you press option and click on your mask, it shows you where you painted. And there's some blue areas there that I, that I didn't paint, that I didn't make brighter. So if you click on, double click on the circle, your dialog box comes up. You can change the color of your blues basically. And that just needs to be more purple, that area. And I'm going to desaturate just a little bit. So if you click on the mask and press command I again, it's going to get rid of it. And then I'm going to press B for my brush tool again, and then paint that hue saturation layer where those like those green colors are appearing. Like, I guess those are flares. And let's extend that so that it it's all there we go so you can see especially like well like in this area like here and here there's there's before and there's after see it took that out so i'm going to make it i'm going to change the slider so it affects more of the blues take some color out there we go a little bit too much color got taken out so now and you can see on the left over here too right there so there's before and after so there now it's more even okay all right now okay so now let's see anything else we need to take out this stuff back here you know i could probably I can darken that down. Let's 
let's let's get the quick selection tool, which is W. I'm going to go to my original layer, and then I'm going to select this area, and then I'm going to hit Option Command R, bring up my quick selection or my refine edge. I'm going to select my refine edge tool here, and then I'm just going to paint along the tree on the top of the tree line so it just selects the trees. It should work pretty good. I've got my shift edge to negative 14. I've feathered it 0.2 pixels, smoothed it two pixels, and the radius is, is four pixels. And so, and I've got it, I'm gonna set it to selection for my output, and I've got remember settings checked. So now I'm gonna hit, okay. Now it's got those checked. So I'm gonna make, I'm, so now I've got a selection. If I go down to curves and make an adjustment curves layer, it's gonna use that selection to, to create my curves layer. So it's that the mask is automatically created for me if you, if you option click on it. So now, that's going to be my shadows more than likely, but I'm going to double click on that little circle, hit my little hand tool. So that shows you on the curve where that, where that is, that range is. So I'm going to make that darker. So I don't want the whole thing darker, obviously. I'm going to click the mask, press G for my gradient, whites my foreground, blacks my background, click here, and then just kind of fade it out and then fade it down there too. And actually we need that a little bit on the grass. There we go. So now if you turn that off and on, there you go. Looks a little bit more even now. And okay, so we're looking pretty good here, I feel like. Um, anything else like with liquify? I mean, let's let's flatten it. I, now I don't recommend flattening images until you know you're good, but at this point I do know I'm good because it helps you work faster, basically, is, is the point of it. Let's look at the before. There's the before. If you if you press option and click on a layer on the eyeball, and then it 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 makes all the other layers invisible. There's what we got so far. So we're looking pretty good. Let's, I tell you what, let's, let's group the hue saturation. No, actually there's the curves and the, where we faded, where we went over the background there. Let's, let's group those. I've selected both of them with holding command. Then I'm gonna hit the, the group button. Let's, let's change the opacity. Let's lower it and just see. That actually looks like it fits a little bit better. I like that better. It's a 76% opacity now. So there's before and there's after. Now it looks a little bit more real and it doesn't look like you've cloned it quite so much. Now, if you wanted to go even further, I can press Shift Command N to create a new layer, or you can go down here to this button right here below the layers. And then you could do, you could select your um, your healing brush sample. Cause, because the reason I'm doing this is see that little cloud pattern, it's up here. So some people might see that. So I'm gonna get rid of that and just heal it out. And that way you'll never know, hopefully. I don't think anybody would ever know. Now, the only thing I see now is that this is a little bit too bright because that flare. So let's, again, create another curves layer. Select that area, which is going to be, that's in the middle. Darken it, whoop, darken it down like that. And then select my gradient tool. There we go. Maybe even darker. And it probably, it might need some contrast too. So let's make another curves layer on top of that. Clip it by holding uh, option between layers. And then if you go to where it says preset, go to medium contrast. Okay, and then change the opacity. Eh, actually we don't need that, I don't think. We might just need to make it a little bit darker. Let's see what that did. That's not bad. Change the fill maybe a little bit. Okay. All right, that looks a lot better, I feel like. Okay, now we're ready to do some cloning so that she's got some bruises here. So let's just get rid of that curve layer. I'm going to select it and hit delete because we didn't use it. I'm going to make a blank layer on top. And like, so let's get the healing brush again. See if we can fix some of these bruises she's got here. I'm just sampling and painting. Making sure I don't lose any texture. So, see, I lost a little bit of texture right there. Now, and, that, and this stuff isn't a big deal. It's just little things. But little things, taking a lot of little things out can add up. All right. Get 
rid of her hair highlights here that you can't see enough of it for it to really matter. Uh, she doesn't really have any blemishes on her skin. So, okay. All right, it's looking pretty good. There's another bruise when I zoom out. Command plus and command minus zoom out. And then when you when I press the hand, when I just that hand pop up, that's me holding the space bar to grab and mouse around my image. And okay. All right, looking pretty good. Now let's turn that off, turn it back on. Okay, so now I'm gonna flatten my picture because I know I'm good. Make sure you're good, once again, before you flatten it, because the worst thing is when you flatten something and you worked on it for 30 more minutes and then you realize you left something turned on that needed to be turned off or got rid of something, that's even worse because then you can't get it back. So I'm gonna hold, you can you can actually, the quick way to flatten it is go over here, your little uh, bars on the top right and then go to flatten image. Okay, so now we're gonna, let's, let's just liquefy it just because we can. Um, not a lot, but this one doesn't need it. Sometimes I liquefy stuff more than others. Press Command J and then Shift Command X brings up liquefy. So your left and right bracket key make your brush bigger, brush bigger and smaller if you want to do it like that, or Control Option to make it you know left and right, up and down to make it that adjusts the pressure in the uh, liquefy. So let's just kind of shape everything a little bit. And again, don't don't go too crazy here because that was probably too much. Because if you do, I mean, it's going to be obvious. You don't want to make somebody's muscles look weird. But shaping them a little bit doesn't doesn't hurt. Just little things can make a big difference sometimes. If I hold Command and then click, that's my zoom for in here for in the uh, liquify dialog. Even little things like making like the hair have a, like a more rounded arc. And now you're also gonna adjust the noise when you do this. So see how my pixels are they're squishing a little bit. See like right there, that's obvious. You don't want, you want to avoid that. That's why you only, you want to do this minimally. Uh, okay, all right, I think. We're looking pretty good. So if you hit the P button in the liquify tool, uh, dialog, then it shows before and after. Okay, now hit enter. And all right, we're looking good. Let's flatten it again. Command E will take, will flatten, will uh, make your top layer go down and, and merge with the bottom layer. This area is still a little bit too bright. And then let's make a curves layer, darken it down just a little bit, and then gradient. I'm on my, I'm on my mask. Yeah, it's better. And then take it off the bottom. Okay. And I'm going to paint that in actually with white as my foreground color for my brush, 10% flow. I'm just going to paint in some of these shadows here or some of these darker areas in the clouds just to kind of blend this. There we go. I'm also going to select my eyedropper tool by pressing I. I'm gonna select this color in the clouds. So I got my background selected. That blue color, I'm gonna click on my curves and it's solid color. Hit okay, and then I'm gonna clip it to curves. So that's gonna make this mask applied to this color fill. And then I'm gonna change that blending mode on the top left to color. Now, see, that kinda, now I don't, I don't want it on the grass, but see what it did to the clouds? It kind of made everything that blue color. So I'm going to select my mask and, and draw a gradient. Oops, see, I'm both, I'm black on my foreground and background. So I'm going to hit D for default and then take that off my trees down there. And you can even change the color if you want to. It's too much. And I, that actually looks pretty good. I'm going to duplicate that. I'm going to delete the mask. Select and make a new mask, press Command-I to invert it, and then with a brush, 
paint that blue over some of this area where it looks a little bit green. I lost some color for some reason. Now it's got a little bit more even. Okay. Yeah, that looks much better. Okay. Shift Command E will flatten my image. That's a quick key for it. Okay, now. So now we're going to run frequency separation and we're not going to need a lot of it, but I'm just going to briefly run over it. So again, select the 16 bit one, hit play in your actions. It's going to ask you to blur it. And it wants you to blur it just enough where you can't see any detail. So if you click the, the little uh, dialog, it shows you before and after. So that's pretty good. I can't see any detail there. It's all blurred just enough. Okay. So now I've got some extra steps in here. I've got a blank layer in the middle. And then I've got another one, another layer here that's blurred out. But I'm, not gonna, I'm just going to delete that. We don't need that. I've got this, the blur layer. If you hit option and click, you can see it's blurred. That isolates it. I've got it copied just because I like to work on copies so I don't have to delete the whole set. All right, so here's your detail. I've also got that copied too. So this is your detail layer. I'm gonna isolate that. Okay, so now I've got it copied and I've got it clipped. So if you copy, it's set to linear light. If you copy that layer, clip it to the one below it and set it to normal, then you have a layer that you can clone and heal with and it won't destroy it. So in other words, you could just delete that layer and then duplicate that again and set it to normal and go again if you mess it up. Because as, as it is, he's just got the detail layer, the blurred layer, one of each. So you, I made a color layer in between where I'm going to paint color. And then I've got both those layers duplicated. That's built into my action. And again, you can select the, the step and hit, and, and hit record and then stop once you're done if you want to add uh, uh, something into the process there of the action. Okay. So the way I do this is typically I turn off if something's clipped to another layer, if you turn off the bottom one, they both go away. So this isn't going to need a lot, but I'm going to select my blank layer here. Brush tool, make it nice and soft. I'm just going to kind of blend this together. So what I'm going to do is when I hold option, it's going to select the eyedropper tool. It selects the color and then paints, select the color next to it and paint. And it's just going to smooth everything out just a little bit. And I usually try to make my highlights a little bit bigger right here and kind of just blend them in on her cheek especially, and this highlight on her nose, I'm gonna straighten that out. Right there, that shadow. Bring that shadow in. And, okay, so here, what I'm gonna do, if you go to the blurred layer, the color layer, and you select your lasso tool, L is the shortcut. There's a few different ones, the regular lasso tool. And I'm going to feather it one pixel so the edge isn't super sharp. If you grab, if you grab, see that, that's kind of blotchy right there. If you go to filter, and it's, Gaussian blur is your last step. So I'm, if you press command F, it's going to blur it again. That's going it, to, what it's doing is it's blurring that area. So it's going to kind of like make it a little bit more of a seamless transition. So you can see that edge a little bit. So I'm going to make my feather two pixels actually. So that's. Any, anytime you've got like splotchy skin, if you go in and blur the color layer in that spot, then it's going to help even it out a little bit. And there's some, you know, to an, and then if you can't, if you get to an extent, to an extent and it won't work anymore, then you may have to go onto the color layer, the blank layer and draw off with just a regular paintbrush, which is, which, which is what I was just doing. Um, but a lot of times this will work fine. See, I've made that transition easier right there, or smoother right there. And with her skin, her skin is not bad at all. So this is probably, it's, it's more likely to work by just doing this on somebody that has good makeup or good skin to begin with. If it's if somebody had really bad acne, you may have, you're gonna have to go in the color layer probably and adjust it, but. So deselect or command D deselects. So if you turn that on and then, so that you can see what it did. Now let's turn the detail back on so we can see the whole thing. So if you turn that layer off or before or after, see how nice and smooth that is. Okay. So the last thing I don't need to go in, you can go into the detail layer if you want to, like a, that's not a blemish, but if you wanted to get rid of that, you could select your stamp tool or your healing brush and make sure it's set to where it says sample set to current layer only. You're on the clip layer and let's say you want to get rid of that. Click sample and then paint and see that's going to get rid of the deep. This is working on the detail only. 
So that's the advantage to frequency separation. It's a lot easier to set when you separate the color from the detail, right? And like this hair, if we want to get rid of it, hairs are, you can get rid of those really easy with this technique. Most of the time, not always. So I'm just cloning right now, like I said. And you can use the healing brush too, um, but you, you know, you want to make sure that you, now see, I lost some texture on there. So I'm going to select my eraser tool, 20% flow, and just kind of like barely erase right there. But again, we didn't really need to do that because it's just like freckles, but I, just to show you, like that little spot right there, perfect example, that's easily taken care of with frequency separation right there. Okay, so now, so turn it, I'm gonna turn the group off before and after. So now one more thing I'm gonna do on the top, I'm gonna make a dodge and burn layer. I've got, a, I've got an action for that, even though it's simple. So right here, all it is is a 50% gray layer. So you can go, you press shift command in name it dodge and burn or whatever and then color or i'm sorry you want to set it to overlay and then once once you set that to overlay then you can click this and it'll make it 50 percent gray which is what you want now it's invisible but it's there see if you command click on it you can see it uh, i've just got to action because it's quicker so so what you're i'm gonna use the dodge and burn tool which is o for the quick key exposures it 5%. I've got protect tones checked. So I'm going to, I'm just going to enhance the shadows and the highlights. So if you hold option, it's going to make it, it's in, in, in paint, it's going to make it, it's going to burn, it's going to darken it. And then if you let go of option, just paint, it's going to make it brighter. It's going to dodge. So I'm just, I'm or I'm just, I'm just dodging and burning over what's already there. And so again, so if like this area, I want it to be brighter. So I'm going to paint with a small brush, make it a little bit bigger, make it a little bit bigger. And like I said, anything that you build up with in Photoshop is going to look better. And I'm going to go relatively quick here just for time's sake, because I know I've, I've been at this for a while. I don't want you guys to get bored. So brighten up, brighten that up, kind of darken her cheek down. That, extend that highlight a little bit more, kind of darken that area, brighten that area of her lip. Okay, now, like, so that highlight, if I wanted to smooth that out, that's going to be on the detail layer. So I'm going to click that again, get my stamp tool, and again, make sure you're on current layer only, sample, and just kind of paint over the edges just to kind of get that nice and smoothed out there. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my dodge and burn layer and just do a little bit more here. Kind of brighten up some highlights on the cleats. Brighten the highlight on the ball, make my brush bigger, bigger, and then get that shadow in there. And then she's got a black shirt on, so there's only so much you can do with highlights, but I'm going to draw some highlights in just to see if I can make it stand out a little bit more where it's brighter, maybe give the illusion of a little bit more contrast. So I'm just painting aggressively over the highlights here on the dodge and burn layer. Okay. So now if you click, if you command or option click on that layer, there's where you painted. Now, I, now, this wasn't a beauty picture, so like normally you'd have the, but you see the beginnings of the face outline there, but you're basically just drawing over it. And you don't want to overdo this because it, you can do it way too long. But I'm going to do a little bit more up here. Smooth that out a little bit. Right up her cheek, maybe. Brighten up that area, darken that. See if I can brighten up the highlighter or hair a little bit more. Okay, there we go. There we go. All right, now, so there's before and there's after. You can see her legs have made a big, pretty big difference. Again, you don't want to overdo this because you can do way too much. Okay, I'm going to flatten it. Shift, Command, E. And then the last thing I'm going to do, I'm going to duplicate. I'm going to press Command, J. 
where I'm going to go to filter other, actually I'm going to make two of these. I'm going to set it to overlay, duplicate it again. I'm going to go to the first one and I'm going to go to filter other high pass. I'm going to set it to radius of two. And then the top one, I'm going to do the same thing, filter other high pass, but I'm going to set it to like a hundred. And then I'm going to drop the opacity over here on the right down to 20. I'm just going to press two on that layer. And so now if I hold, if I select both those by pressing shift or command, and then I can press command G or hit the group button. See it sharpened it. There's before, there's after. And then the other one, the small one does the details. So that's more of a sharpen, see before, after. Okay. And if you wanted to, what you can do with the, with the sharpen layer is you can go to the background and do select subject, select subject. And hopefully it's going to select, yep, it did a pretty good job selecting her. If you want to get, refine it, you can. Option, command R. Let's kind of see if we can refine edge her hair here just so it's a little bit more precise, which it's not the end of the world if it's not with something like this. Maybe get the edge of her cleat. Okay, so I'm gonna hit okay. I've got selection set as my output. My settings are the same as before. That did that did a good job on her hair. Okay, so now it's got her selected. I'm gonna open the group and the small high pass, the sharpen. I'm just gonna I'm gonna mask that. So if you click if you option click on the mask, you can see that. So she's sharpened. The background is not. See if I hold shift and click the mask, it makes it disappear. So that's the background sharpened, and there's not sharpened. So that makes her sharper, which makes her stand out more. Okay, so there's before and there's after. And then one more thing, I might go to the adjustment layers, select a black and white layer, set it to soft light, and then maybe like hit two for like 20% opacity. Maybe like, let's try 15, I'm gonna type one five. And it's making the blacks, the shadows pretty, pretty dark. So if you double click on the side of the layer, your layer styles box comes up. Under here, under where it says blend if, where you're on gray, Hold option and when you so when you move this carrot to the right, that means that it's that layer is only going to show up where everything is brighter in the highlights. So that's gonna that's gonna make it not show up in the shadows. So and if you hold option, then it actually makes it more precise and it gives you a preview in the background. So I feel like it's blocking her up too much in her shirt. See? So if I hold option and mouse over, now it's gonna it's gonna stay in the highlights, but it's gonna do it less the more you mouse to the right and then if you move that other carrot, it just kind of like smooths it out. Hit OK. So there's before we did blend if, after, and then if you turn it off, which it's not going to be. Let's make it a let's make it um, let's make it thirty percent. Now see it's brightened up the shadows a little bit. Now and that may have been too much. Maybe we need to make it affect the shadows a little bit more in the neutrals. There we go. There we go. Let's make it, and maybe that was too, go back over to the right a little bit, 20%. You can see in the background, it's definitely affecting that a little bit. It's just adding a little bit of contrast and punch to it. There we go. Now, before, after. So now I'm gonna flatten it, select all of them. Top layer, top group, press shift, select the background, press command E, and it is flattened. So that is it. So if we go, if we save it, press command S, I'm going to get out of full screen mode by pressing F. My computer doesn't lock up on me. And it's going to save it back in the Lightroom beside the other one eventually. There we go. And I'm going to color it blue by pressing 9. So it makes my thumbnail blue. Oh, I don't have blue filtered, so I'm going to click my blue color. There we go. Now, so there's before, or there's before, and there's after. So if we want to do, I'm going to create a virtual copy. I'm going to reset it. I'm going to I'm going to sync. I'm going to go to the, the one that we color corrected in Lightroom. Hold shift, select the virtual copy, press shift, command S, check none, and then I'm going to, I'm going to check the crop, and that's it. So it syncs them. And then I'm going to select all three by pressing command and press N. That way they all three come up. Press shift tab. 
So there's the original with nothing done to it. There's the color corrected in Lightroom and then there's the retouched on the left. So, so there's original toned in Lightroom and then the final. And you can see like it's small differences, like look at her face. Like there's more, there, it's shaped better with the frequency separation. It's liquefied, the background's taken care of. There's more contrast, it's sharper. But you know, other than that, it's not a lot, but it does make a difference, honestly. And it's subtle differences, but that's the key to retouching, in my opinion, to make it look real. You wanna go over the top, that's too much. I want it to look, I want it to look perfect, but at the same time, I want it to look realistic. So original Lightroom. Photoshop. Okay, guys, that's it. Uh, that took uh, quite a bit of time, so I don't. I, I'm not going to go over another one, but I would basically use the same process on all these. I might do some more frequency separation and dodging and burning on a picture like this. But uh, you know, I mean, I pretty much use the same process for everything. It just kind of depends on what the photo needs. So, if you have any questions, you can feel free to email me. Maybe. My website is, I've got two, Matt Hernandez Creative and Matt Hernandez Photography. MattHernandezPhotography.com is probably the one that you guys are going to want to look at because it's got my sports pictures on it only. Uh, but my um, my email address is Matt at MattHernandezCreative.com. Um, Twitter is at Matt Hernandez, which I'm not as active on. Instagram and Facebook, definitely Instagram I'm more active on. That's also at Matt Hernandez. So um, that's it. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed my class. And like I said, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks.